Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Echo Asthma Bootcamp. My name is Ashley. I am your facilitator. I'm joined today by my coordinators, Rachel and Tabitha, and our wonderful hub team. We have Dr. Meredith McCormick, Dr. Lewis Karitsky, and Andrea Jensen, certified asthma educator. Um, Dr. McCormick, would you like to start by introducing yourself to the group? Hi, my name is Meredith McCormick. It's great to be here with you this afternoon. I'm the director of the Johns Hopkins Asthma Center and uh, look forward to, to interacting with you throughout the session. Thank you so much. Dr. Karitsky? My name is Louis Karitsky. I'm a family medicine physician. I've been in academics for a long, long time. Started out at UCLA in 1976, affiliated with University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida from 1983 till 2015 and affiliated now with University of Central Florida with a residency program also located in Gainesville, Florida. Very happy to join you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and Andrea? Hi, everybody. I'm from Utah. I'm about an hour south of Salt Lake City. We have the greatest snow on earth. Just wanted to throw that out there. I'm a certified asthma educator. I run an asthma home visit program. I'm funded through the CDC. Um, I also have asthma and allergies, and I raise three kids that are adults now uh, that have allergies and asthma as well. So it's been a fun ride. And Andrea has been with us through many boot camps now, so we're, we're very happy to have her here for another one. We're happy to have uh, all of you with us today. Uh, looks like we have a nice big group. So, and uh, now let's get started with our first lecture hosted by Dr. Sucharita Kerr. This is on defining severe asthma. Good day, everybody, and welcome to the Echo Asthma Bootcamp, Intensive Training for Severe Asthma Care. My name is Dr. Sucharita Kerr. I'm an assistant professor at Tufts University School of Medicine and a pulmonologist in the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at Tufts Medical Center in Boston. The learning objectives for this program include describe how GINA guidelines impact the current standard of care, identify criteria for severe asthma and asthma phenotypes to avoid diagnostic delay, Assess severe asthma treatment options and identify which patient would benefit based on their phenotype and endotype. Evaluate shared decision making and incorporate into your practice. So in today's session, we'll talk about defining severe asthma. So what is the definition of severe asthma? The American Thoracic Society and the European Respiratory Society have defined severe asthma as one that requires treatment with guideline suggested medications for GINA steps four and five, which usually include high dose inhaled corticosteroids, as well as a second controller regimen and or systemic steroids for more than 50% of the previous year to either prevent it from becoming uncontrolled or that remains uncontrolled despite this therapy. It accounts for about five to 10% of patients with asthma and it nearly contributes to 50% of the healthcare costs for asthma, which is often into the billions. So when is asthma considered uncontrolled? It's defined mainly by symptoms. So anybody with frequent daytime or nighttime poor symptom control, patients who have frequent exacerbations, particularly severe exacerbations that require two or more bursts of steroids in the prior year, each burst being more than three days each, History of serious exacerbations, such as those that require hospitalization or intensive care unit stay or mechanical ventilation in the prior year, and evidence of expiratory airflow limitation on spirometry. So these are patients who have pre-bronchodilator FEV1 below 80% predicted and a ratio of FEV1 to FEC below the lower limits of normal. But I'd like to bring to your attention that not all uncontrolled asthma is severe. In fact, severe asthma is just a subset of asthma that is overall uncontrolled. And I'd like to try to differentiate between what severe asthma is and differentiating it from difficult to manage asthma. So when I approach asthma as a pulmonologist, I take this five-pronged approach. I often talk to the patients about what is it in their environment that triggers their asthma, such as smoking. This can be primary or secondhand smoking can be exposure to certain pets. It's quite common in the patient population I see. Exposure to mold or dust or seasonal exposure such as pollen or ragweed based on the season of the year. 
the next is to talk about adherence. And one of the first things I do is to look at the patient's inhaler technique. It's really important that they use their inhalers correctly, not only because they should be getting optimal medication dose, but also to really prevent side effects, particularly if their inhaler technique is not correct. Thereafter, really inquiring about some of the other barriers to non-adherence, and many of them are non-intentional. Some of these inhalers are quite expensive, and talking about whether cost is an important consideration for the patient to be able to use their inhalers is extremely important. What are their beliefs about inhaler use in asthma? And finally, the lack of knowledge or health literacy. A lot of patients don't necessarily understand the difference between a controller regimen and an as-needed or emergency use inhaler. And it's really important for us as healthcare providers to be able to educate our patients because ultimately that leads to improved adherence. It's important to assess psychosocial problems such as anxiety, depression, or social isolation. A lot of these are predictors of poor asthma outcomes as well as emergency room visits. And then assessing for comorbidities, gastroesophageal reflux disease that can worsen asthma, recurrent rhinosinusitis, or aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, all of which are different manifestations of asthma, but certainly can ultimately lead to difficult to manage or difficult to control asthma. Obesity has been associated with more severe asthma, difficult to control asthma, and then really looking for vocal cord dysfunction or paradoxical vocal cord motion disorder, where when a patient attempts to inhale, the vocal cords adduct, leading to difficulty breathing. And it's particularly important to assess because it can actually coexist in about a third or 37% of patients who also have asthma. And so it's important to differentiate between the two. And then incorrect or coexisting diagnoses. After you've looked at the first four columns here, it's really important, and especially if the patient's not doing better, it's important to ensure that we diagnose the patient appropriately. Or do they have another coexisting diagnosis? Eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis um, is a syndrome of vasculitis where asthma is actually a part of it. And so if the patient has difficulty to control a severe asthma, it's important to evaluate to see if they may have the syndrome. Similarly, if they have exposure to mold or a hypersensitivity to mold, do they have allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis? And a lot of my asthmatics have smoked or, had, or have had significant secondhand smoke exposure, putting them at risk for COPD or the so-called asthma COPD overlap syndrome, which needs to be managed somewhat differently than just regular asthma. And then once all of this is done, it's really important that we do our part and really follow the guidelines to ensure that we are appropriately managing these patients according to what the guidelines recommend. You may have seen this slide before. This is from the Global Initiative for Asthma, the 2020 update, and it represents asthma management for adults and adolescents over the age of 12. And most patients with asthma can get treated with step, between step two and step four treatment. And it's not until we really reach step four and step five when we should really consider the possibility of severe asthma. This is when these patients require a combination of medium to high dose inhaled corticosteroids and a long-acting bronchodilator, perhaps even a leukotriene antagonist and a theotropy mist. And this is when really we should start thinking about what else can we provide for our patients to get better control on their asthma. And so to reiterate, it's not until we've really ruled out all the reversible causes of asthma or potential triggers and eliminated them do we attribute somebody as having severe asthma. And so it's really important to differentiate between these two. Now, why is it important to do? Because really standard treatments may not be adequate in patients with severe asthma. And it really comes down to the fact that severe asthma is quite a heterogeneous disease. It's a disease with different symptoms and triggers. Patients respond differently to treatments and they even have a different clinical course. Even within a patient's lifetime, there may be periods where patients are very well controlled on as needed inhalers such as albuterol or perhaps one inhaler, one steroid inhaler. But they may go through a lifetime based on exposure to some of the symptoms that they actually may require two or three controller regimens to get their asthma adequately controlled. We don't quite understand the natural history uh, or the long-term history of severe asthma. 
Some have postulated the role of bacterial infection. Pseudomonas and Haemophilus influenzae have been identified and isolated in these patients' lungs, even though they don't have underlying other structural lung disease, such as bronchiectasis. Similarly, chlamydia infections have been associated with fixed airflow obstruction. A lot of this is hypothesis, and there's much work going on to understand severe asthma better. There's also variation in the presence and the type of airway inflammation. Some of these are eosinophilic. Some of these are predominantly neutrophilic inflammation. Some of them is a combination or mixed of both eosinophilic and neutrophilic. And some may predominantly be non-inflammatory, that they have no inflammation or predominantly structural disease in their airways. Patients with severe asthma tend to have thicker epithelium, increased smooth muscle mass, and they also tend to be less responsive to inhaled steroids, uh, oral steroids, as well as demonstrate more air trapping. Thank you for listening, and we'll open this up for some question and answers. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you, Dr. Kerr, as always, for that lecture. Uh, now we'd like to open up the floor to our hub team and ask uh, Dr. McCormick, what do you feel are our key takeaways for the group from this lecture? Great. Um, I think really just thinking about the difference between asthma control and asthma severity was emphasized. Um, and then within that poorly controlled group, thinking about the actionable, when we have patients in front of us, thinking about the things that are actionable to try to improve control. Um, I really like the section about adherence and talking about um, how patients may use their medications, triggers that they may avoid um, so that we can really improve uh, the, those things that are, that are targets and important to, to talk to our patients about. Thank you. Dr. Kuritsky? Yes, thank you. Well, I certainly enjoyed our colleague's presentation. Uh, I think the main messages that I take away are that similar to hypertension, asthma is a phenotype, that there are many different flavors of asthma and there is no one size fits all. We've not taken care to try to distinguish that in the past. And I think we're just really on the brink of being able to better categorize subgroups. Um, I, I also wanna make sure that the message is not lost as we focus on severe asthma there's still between four and 5,000 deaths a year from asthma. So asthma is a serious disease. And unfortunately, it's not easy to predict which patients with asthma will have to pay a terrible price. The mortality data in asthma shows fairly well distributed between mild, moderate, and severe asthma, those who die. So some people who underestimate uh, uh, really need to take another look at this as well as their clinicians. I remember uh, seeing a study of over a decade ago now called Asthma in America, and they asked patients, how's your asthma? Do you, do you wake up at night? Oh, yeah, a few nights a week. How many times do you use your inhaler? Oh, well, I use it every day. I mean, I, well, I have to. I have asthma. And they asked them all these series of questions, and then they said, well, how is your asthma control? They said, fine. So we need, as we approach asthma, and in particular severe asthma, patients need to to gain our newer insights into what constitutes well-controlled asthma, and they're entitled to better control. There's no reason for them to be placed at risk simply because we clinicians need to do a much better job of promulgating the, the concepts of what control, what, what constitutes well-controlled asthma. And then finally, I have sort of a question at the same time. When we talk about knowing what severe asthma is, I think if you, want to read Gina, you have to look it up. It's not published in a journal, is it? I think you have to go to www.gina to find it. And that, as a primary care clinician, I'm a very busy guy. You would never see any footprints on my desk for me setting my feet on top of there. And so it would really be helpful if the Gina folks would do two things for us. First, publish those guidelines in a primary care journal. So they're like JAMA or New England Journal, the same way the USPSTF now not only publishes their ideas in MMWR, but also in JAMA. Maybe they could put it someplace where it have would enjoy widespread readership because otherwise nobody knocks on my door to say, hey, Karitsky, there's a new GINA update. Why haven't you read it? it? It happens after the fact. So because of my concern for patients with asthma, I wanna know yesterday what can help them today and tomorrow. 
Thank you, Dr. Kritsky. And yeah, that's why you know we have the GINA guidelines highlighted in this first uh, this first lecture. We talk about it all throughout the program, and then we give you links in the um, PowerPoint presentation that we'll send over to everyone tomorrow, so that you have access to it. But yeah, thank you. Completely agree. It should be more widely spread. Um, Andrea, do you have anything to add at all? Yes, and um, thank you both for for your perspective uh, in public health. I love our partnership with our clinics here locally because we sort of fill in the gaps. You diagnose and prescribe, and then we come in behind and, and check inhaler technique, check to see what's going on in the home. And it's really interesting. Uh, one of the things that Dr. Kerr mentioned was compliance. And so if you ask them how often they use their inhaler, of course, they're going to say, oh, I use it every day. But if you rephrase it a little bit differently and say, you know, about how often do you use your inhaler? Because I know for me personally, I'll only remember maybe two or three days a week. And then they'll say, oh, well, I take mine about four days a week. So then you're really getting to the real answer of what's really going on. So really getting to that compliance, really getting to environmental factors. And then uh, inhaler technique, I hardly ever find anyone that has correct inhaler technique. And then really looking closely at those that really have severe asthma. I have a 26 year old son that had, had severe asthma. And um, when he was younger, he's a titch better now. But through 2000 and about 2008, he was in the hospital eight times in ICU twice. And he was, uh, he was on the highest step and it wasn't until we started a biologic that it really literally saved his life. So um, you can have everybody do everything right, remove carpeting from their home, do every environmental remediation they can. And you can still have that tiny little percentage that no matter what you do, um, they're just not gonna be well controlled. So really being able to tease out that group who really has severe asthma versus who's just you know, not compliant and, you know, the cat sleeps in their bed and grandma smokes. And so um, trying to figure out what's right for that particular patient is, is really hard sometimes. Thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, so do we have any questions from the group about this lecture um, or just in general, feel free to uh, raise your hand, turn your, your camera on or ask in the chat. While you're talking, while you're thinking, just building on what Andrea said, uh, it made me think about a tool that I find really useful in my um, my clinic. I'm going to just paste it in the chat, just an example. But it's a little poster. It's a poster, but that you can print out actually on the size of an eight by ten. And maybe you'll you'll uh, um, maybe Andrea's about. Yes, that's exactly right. And I start all of my conversations. You know, you've got a whole stack of them which is great because they're our most sort of a uh, uh, pilfered item. If, if you find, you know they're a great resource because they're always yeah. disappearing. Yeah, um, you can, the tear pads aren't that expensive on Allergy and Asthma Network. And then I have the big posters on my wall as well. But yes, I think you're right. I mean, really empowering each person to say, this is what's available. Here's where we are. This would be the next step according to the national guidelines. Check back with your doctor, see what she has to say, but really empowering them is so important to let them know that there's there's more than one inhaler on the market. We have a laminated copy and in each room. And so what I usually do when I start talking about medications is I just slide that across the, the desk and say, which, which medicines are you on? And when they pick them, I say, well, how do you take them? Like, how do you take that one? When do you take it? And it's a, first of all, it's very efficient. And it also will give you that information if, if um, patients are confused between the controller and they're as needed. Um, if they start, if they have more than one medication in a category, then you'll pick that up. You get so much information and it's very fast. Um, so I really love that resource. How should, we, how should we address questions that come up in the chat box? Do you? That's, do you yes, you're, you're reading my mind, week? Dr. Kurtzky. I, I read them out um, out loud because uh, we will be we are uh, recording this session and then uh, but you can't see what's in the chat. So I always read them out loud and then pose those to the group. So um, we do have a question from Susan in the chat um, to asking how is obesity and asthma? How are obesity and asthma related? So I, I certainly the literature shows that obesity is associated with more severe and more refractory asthma. There are a number of putative explanations given for that, 
In other words, we say, well, we see that obese patients have more difficult and more refractory asthma. What might explain that? And I would still have to put that in the category of might. Perhaps my uh, colleague, Dr. McCormick, knows that it is rather than might. But we know that persons who are overweight uh, take less deep inspiration because of their abdominal girth and mass. It tends, a mass it tends to push up the diaphragm. So they're not uh, able to have as deep an inspiration. Of course, during exacerbations of asthma, there's more air trapping, which is compounded by intra-abdominal girth. In addition, obesity is associated with a variety of adverse cytokines that might mag magnify or augment uh, other inflammatory stimuli. So the observation is on sound ground that obesity is associated with uh, worse outcomes, but the actual underpinnings of why that is the case are, to my knowledge so far, speculative, including the two that I uh, mentioned to you. Perhaps Dr. McCormick has other insights. I would completely agree with uh, what you said. And um, one additional factor that we're really thinking a lot about is um, within obese asthma, how metabolic drivers, so metabolic syndrome and diabetes and even prediabetes may play a role. So there's some evidence that um, the hyperglycemia that even comes before diabetes and the insulin resistance may be part of what drives that increased morbidity uh, that you described that we see in obese asthma. So I think, you know, there's still a lot to learn um, and there's a lot of science going on. I think from a practice, like to try to understand that better, I think from a practical standpoint, one thing we could all be doing is making sure that we're thinking about, um, particularly in primary care, um, hemoglobin A1C, other, other screening tools to make sure that we're picking up diabetes or prediabetes and then partnering with um, and, or, or uh, addressing those aspects of care. Thank you both. I don't, I don't know if this is true in pulmonary medicine. In uh, primary care women's health, uh, obese women die at higher rates of cervical cancer. And when I first studied that, I thought, well, is there something in the inflammatory milieu? Does it have to do with the aromatization of estrogen that is more intense in, in overweight and obese women? It had nothing to do with that. It turned out that overweight and obese women feel like they get such a chilling reception from healthcare providers that they don't go in for screening with the same frequency as their more slender age matched counterparts. So we as clinicians have to be very careful to validate, respect, and accept persons regardless of the health issue. Too many clinicians still view obesity as the patient is the culprit instead of the victim. That's fascinating. Thank you, Dr. Kritsky. Uh, we have another question from Dorothy. Uh, Dorothy says, how aggressive is the focus on the severe group to identify underlying food allergies, not just blood tests, but actual dietary challenges? So I think for me, um, I do focus on aller allergic drivers, including environmental um, drivers, uh, and then food allergy, I particularly try to um, understand and take a history around obviously food intake and temporality or any, um, sometimes patients will give a history of having tr done on their own, trying to omit certain foods from their diet. And then if they found uh, improvement or if they have other risk factors for food allergy or history or family history, and then I'll, I really then would pair with uh, an allergist um, to, to try to address that further. I do RAS testing, which doesn't, which I think you're referring to, which doesn't um, address food allergies uh, pretty routinely in my patients. Um, but, but food allergy is one that I, I at least recognize that it's outside of what I'm assessing for. And then really that, that's where I uh, partner with my other subspecialty colleagues. Now, food allergy is a much less frequent driver of symptoms in, al in asthma than it is in atopic dermatitis or allergic rhinosinusitis. So especially in that population in whom you'd see either of those, there is a pretty well-established list of uh, food uh, culprits. The top of the list is eggs, for instance. And so you can advise parents that list is readily available. There's a, a large list of foods that have shown positive skin tests in atopic subjects versus a much more narrow list of persons who have confirmed with double blind food challenges where the food's actually placed in a capsule so they can't tell. So that show there are about a dozen foods that are commonplace culprits. The good thing is that as opposed to 
celiac disease where gluten elimination knocks out such a large population. In food allergy, it's generally only one or two foods. So it's not a wide gamut that has to be eliminated from a diet in order to reap the benefits of looking at food allergy as a possible contributor. Thank you. Uh, we have some, some great uh, information from Lisa in the chat um, about, let's take a look here, um, assessing symptom control uh, that they use the Baylor College of Medicine rules of two uh, as a teaching tool <clears throat> and uh, mentioned the asthma control test and uh, a, a helpful link in the chat. So we'll add that to our, just to remind everyone, we have a resource page on our website um, and we're building that after every single session. So links and, and helpful tools always uh, end up on the resource page. So please make sure to take a look at that. We'll add that over there. So thank you so much, Lisa. Um, and um, your question that, uh, why are we referring to GINA versus NIH? I think we do touch on the newest iteration of the NIH guidelines. I, they just updated them, is that correct? Yeah, so um, it just so happens that this these were the more most updated um, guidelines when we began the program. Um, okay. At the NIH guidelines hadn't been updated for uh, something like seven years. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I think that was really why we put the focus there. But um, we we do have the NIH guide. We do touch on the NIH guidelines, uh, the update, and we probably will have that also in the resource area. Okay. I was just wondering. I wasn't sure because I'm I'm more pediatrics. I wasn't sure because of adults. Were you mainly using? Because we we mainly refer here to the NIH EPR three guidelines, and we reviewed the updates. Um, you know, it's not, we like we like some of the different um, treatment options that are on the GINA guidelines, especially for the asthma flares. Mm. However, even though we would like it, we're in pediatric pulmonary. We would love to prescribe that way. Um, th what we find is that the insurance uh, carriers will not approve the medications being used the way the GINA guidelines. So, it doesn't. You know, it, even though we refer to them, we try to get authorization and stuff. You know, they don't allow for, let's say, escalating therapy with an inhaled steroid lava combination therapy for an exacerbation or you know, a PRN. They would they just won't approve it. Mm -hmm. And we're being as creative as we can with our prescribing that way. So, you know, sometimes we do a combination therapy and and as their controller, and then we we prescribe them a an, a separate inhaled steroid inhaler, and it's the first sign of their asthma worsening. We add have them add you know three times a day the inhaled steroid just to get around it, um, but it's it's difficult because really because of the insurance um, barriers. Mm. Yeah, we definitely talk about insurance barriers through the course of the program, and especially at the managing injectable medications session, the very right. last session that we have. Um, and it's just a constant, constant comment. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. You're welcome. Um, Lisa, for what it's worth, I was listening to a webinar yesterday with the Allergy and Asthma mm -hmm. Network with Brad mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. talked about, I believe, their stage three for the combination inhaler that's available in Europe. That would be the Simbacort plus the Saba. Right. right. So, Closer. We're getting closer. <laughs> oh, I hope so, because it's it really is frustrating. It, it makes sense, and we all know, I mean, we know that patients sometimes do that anyway on their own, but um, yeah, to not be able to prescribe that way, not fill out their asthma action plan that way, and have it confusing, like almost like a little secret that you're giving the parent, you know, telling the patient what to do, but you can't prescribe or write it that way. It, it doesn't make any sense. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> All right, well, I think uh, in the interest of time, we have a case presentation volunteered. Uh, Paul Williamson, thank you so much for uh, sending this over to us. So are you are you ready to present? Yes. All right, excellent, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen, okay? And uh, this may be a little bit difficult to read, um, just I apologize, I meant to um, put this in our other format. Um, but I know that Paul will do a wonderful job of, <laughs> of presenting. So go right ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Williamson. I'm a nurse practitioner in our pulmonary division here uh, in Tucson, Arizona. I work for Banner University Medicine. We're affiliated with the University of Arizona. Uh, I work with uh, my uh, Dr. Monica Kraft, who's a researcher, asthma researcher, and <clears throat> we see primarily uh, uncontrolled asthma patients in our clinic. And 
So today, uh, uh, there, this is a 24-year-old male patient that was uh, referred to us by their primary care provider who was on some pretty, uh, 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 he was uncontrolled asthma. And uh, he began as a child, uh, at two, three years old, being diagnosed with asthma. He missed some school, uh, but not a lot. He did have difficulty keeping up with his peers in childhood. And he moved uh, to, to Arizona from LA, California, and seemed to have uh, symptom reduction at that time. And over the court, ensuing years, he did have a waxing and waning course uh, with uh, multiple respiratory medications. Uh, I was on Simbicort, Spareve, Albuterol, Flovent, Monty Lucas, but had really no uh, noticeable improvement. He uh, also had a deviate, pretty severe deviated septum, right deviated septum and uh, nasal polyposis on the left. He was doing nasal irrigations and Flonase daily with moderate to really minimal to moderate uh, relief from that. He, uh, on, on initial visit in, uh, July of, uh, 20, um, of 2020, uh, he had an ACT score of nine, which was not well controlled at all. Um, he did notice uh, increased uh, shortness of breath more at uh, when he was lying supine at night. He also uh, indicated uh, the top of his throat uh, felt like it was closing. Um, at that time, he had symptoms uh, at least three to six times per week. He had some nighttime symptoms as well. Um, patient did have some allergy symptoms like uh, uh, typical uh, uh, rhinitis symptoms um, that they, they were seasonal. Um, he had not had any skin testing. Um, he noticed uh, one of the triggers that he noticed predominant was exercise. There were no other, other uh, triggers. I might note too that uh, he did not have a history of smoking. He, did, he didn't do vaping, no uh, marijuana. Uh, he did have two dogs and three cats that lived with him and his roommate. Um, I would say too that he, uh, in early adulthood, like just after high school, he was a dock worker and started having some problems and symptoms at that time uh, that began to surface um, and unable to uh, take his breath, uh, catch his breath. He had had uh, some... Uh, uh, doses, uh, you know, mineral dose packs at that time. And uh, so uh, he came to us and uh, his, uh, let's see, where were we? You had scroll down there a little bit. Uh, yeah, so he, those were his meds, you know, he was on, actually we switched them over to, uh, from Simbacort 165 to Advair with, with a higher dose of the inhaled corticosteroid. He was saying that most of his medications didn't really help. Uh, so we were concerned about the, uh, uh, you know, the um, inflammation component. Uh, so, and we uh, verified uh, his uh, using a spacer and, uh, and making sure he was taking his medication properly. And also, as was mentioned, the importance of, of, uh, of confirming adherence to medication with asthma is really important. I, there are many patients that, uh, for whatever reason, decide to do one puff instead of two, or do a nighttime and don't do it, or do a morning and do an e evening. So it's a really a re -educate, time to re-educate and uh, go over uh, technique and stuff like that. Um, he did have a lot less physical activity. I noticed that, uh, or noted on here that uh, in the first visit, he had a pretty low uh, ACT, but we saw him again in uh, September. And then we saw him just this last uh, January. And you'll notice in January, um, he had a, uh, a 19 consistent with fare control. Um, so go ahead and scroll. Uh, let's see what we have here. Um, yeah, nothing here. Uh, basically the review systems were uh, nasal in nature, uh, post-nasal drips and nut sinus congestion. And then uh, he did complain of shortness of breath. Physical assessment, his lungs were clear. Uh, we, at that time, the first visit we, ordered, uh, you know, uh, his imaging was uh, non-contributory. He has a normal chest x-ray. We did some uh, spirometry in office the first time and his, he had a little uh, moderate airflow obstruction. Some, uh, you know, FEV1 was 72% uh, predicted. FEC was 79.9. Uh, 
uh, FEC, F, uh, FEV1, FEC ratio was 75%. So, you know, he had uh, some mild um, uh, uh, airflow obstruction. Uh, again, I said his, there were no, his uh, CT and chest X were normal. He had had an incident of uh, sinus, we believe sinus tachycardia over 200. So we, we he did an MCOT and a 30 day MCOT, which was uh, negative. Um, so um, shortness of breath, we, let's see, what else did we do uh, at that time? We were also concerned about with the, uh, with the upper airway uh, manifestation of choking and stuff like that. We were concerned about the, the potential for vocal cord dysfunction. Um, and then uh, we ordered a CBC with differential, obviously to do some endotyping, uh, find out what his EOs were. They were only 130, which really they're elevated, but they're not, they're not high. We usually looking about, uh, you know, 150 or greater. And that's, uh, um, and then uh, let's see, we did a desert panel to see what kind of uh, allergies he had, or if he had any, we checked his IgE as well. And, uh, you know, and then when we had, and then in the interim, uh, so let's see these labs here. So this labs, I can't hardly see them here. Let's see, so. Yeah, so it's the absolute uh, eosinophil count was, moderately elevated, but we, it wasn't suggestive of type two, maybe a little bit. His Beno, which we did the exhaled uh, nitric oxide was uh, on his first visit was 10. So, you know, and let's see, I don't remember if he had finished uh, a course of prednisone, which can mask elevated uh, uh, measures of uh, inflammation, but it was low. So uh, we were, uh, it, we were kind of had a conundrum here. What was going on? With this guy, so I just put in a couple of questions about, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the sinusitis, and we, of course, we know that the contribution of that, especially with his deviated septum and his nasal polyposis, and so we we sort of looked at that. We also look at GERD, but he didn't demonstrate any any uh, problems with the gastroesophageal reflux. <clears throat> We're aware of silent aspiration, but uh, we were sort of going down the road of his sinuses. So I'll stop, I'll stop right now. And then I have a, I can conclude this because we have a, a good outcome uh, in his final visit. Uh, we'll see him again, but when we saw him in, uh, in January, there's some dramatic changes for the benefit, for the good. Thank you so much, Paul. So yeah, uh, at, at this point, uh, we open it up to the hub team and they can, you know, sort of ask any clarifying questions and then we'll talk to the group and make recommendations and kind of go from there. And then Paul, you can sort of summarize. Uh, it seems like you've got some updates. So um, yeah. we'll open this up to the, to the group. Well, I can clearly solve this case. The patient should have been sent to Dr. McCormick. <laughs> yeah, this is not a primary care management case, although I noticed that he did have elevated units. Uh, you might note that your units for eosinophils are pasted on top of the chart, and it might be useful for our audience whenever you present units to present the normal range, because okay. many of us are not familiar with those diagnostics and they won't be able to recognize what, what's out of line. The, Thank you. The, the Kearney units, which is a unit for allergy, was out of line for cat and dog. There's good news and bad news with that. The bad news about the cat is that a person cannot be successfully desensitized to cat while the cat is on the premises and the cat saliva and, and the hair residue are around. That's not true for dog. There is some successful desensitization to dog. People say, uh, you know, to give the cat a bath. I tried giving my cat a bath. She didn't seem to mind. I have some trouble getting her hair off my tongue, but other than that, it seemed to go well. So I think there is some hopefulness. Now there's one thing in which I'm in disagreement about the GINA guidelines. They do not endorse sublingual immunotherapy. And I'm surprised by that because remember that asthmatics and especially severe asthmatics, that is the observed highest risk group for serious consequences for attempted subcutaneous immunotherapy. Most of the deaths ever recorded in the United States have either been due to 
inappropriate dose being given typically by an inexperienced desensitizer or persons with uncontrolled asthma. So I think if this person is going to uh, embark on desensitization, it should be done by an allergist, not a primary care person. And I didn't see the rest of his inhalant profile, uh, his dust, or is he allergic to any kind of a grass or anything? Did anything show up on that profile? You're, you're on, you're yeah, on your right, I, I just unmuted myself. I, you know, I didn't have the profile and, and uh, I was just, as you were speaking, I was looking for it because I didn't see it here in my, uh, in my documentation for today's uh, presentation. So I'd have to look. I, I don't recall what uh, allergies he did have at the time. So I would have to find that for a future. And I, and I had one other question about the history. I noticed that the patient did not check the box about smoking uh, or secondhand smoking. And I, I want to say that when I see patients at any age with upper respiratory infections and they're brought in by a parent or a person they live with, mm -hmm. I ask them, does anyone smoke in the home? And they say, no, we only smoke outside. That is not good enough. The metabolites of nicotine, they zoom up and down in the blood. There is a metabolite called cotinine that is basically the A1C of cigarette smoking. And it's been shown that if you or I who don't smoke and we live in a non-smoking home, have our cotinine level checked, it'll be like three to five. A person who lives in a home of smokers who only smoke outside, their cotinine level is still 20 five times as high as a non-smoking home. And people are surprised to learn that. I know they were trying to protect their child by smoking outside. I know they wanted the best for their child, but it's not good enough. And even when I talk to clinicians about this, they say, what do you mean smoking outside doesn't help? I remind them, every one of us has had a patient who we went to see after they had been in a room for 20 minutes. They certainly didn't smoke in the room, but we couldn't put another patient in that room for an hour or two until the residue of cigarette smoke in the air has been ventilated out that they are carrying cigarette residue with them. Even if they smoked outside, they've got to improve their behavior if they want to protect their at-risk loved one. Yep, that's interesting. Our, our guy did not have any smoking history, but I couldn't say that he wasn't uh, exposed to smoking at some point, but that's uh, information that uh, is relevant and that I didn't really uh, know. In his Did your case. patient happen to ever report uh, sensitivity to aspirin or um, mm -hmm. not steroidals? Well, that's a great question, but he, he did not. He did not. And I'm uh, trying to locate the desert panel for him. That's okay. And wasn't using non-steroidals. That just would be probably another thing in this patient. I might check and see whether um, that could be something uh, just to probe on in terms of history. Given the potential for Samter's triad, the, um, the right. triad of asthma, nasal right. Blood, right. Yeah. and aspirin sensitization. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. yeah. He uh, did have an appointment to see an ENT at our clinic, and uh, he ended up going uh, outside of uh, our clinic to a community ENT. Uh, and when we saw him in January, he actually had had a, a, a sinus surgery. They took out the polyps, they fixed his nose, and he was doing much better. And his ACT score was, at the time we saw him in January, was 19. And he, I remember him saying that he was breathing so much uh, better at that time when we saw him. So I think the, we, we got kind of to the root. He still could be a candidate for biologics given the, the nasal polyposis, but he didn't have the aspirin sensitivity, which would probably rule out the, the Samter's triad. But uh, so that, that was really uh, remarkable. That, uh, that he had done that. So he didn't see our uh, ENT here, but he, he took it on his own to go see a, uh, you know, an outside ENT and have that procedure done. I have a question for you and a comment, and I don't know the answer to this. I'd be grateful if one of our colleagues does. I have seen clinical trial data in patients who have allergic rhinitis that when you treat 
the allergic rhinitis, their asthmatic hyperresponsivity decreases. It's as if there is one unified responsive tissue compartment. So when you quiet down upstairs here, the downstairs seems to quiet down. Now that's in people whose asthma is not treated. I don't know if, since your patient already has a substantial burden of asthma controllers on board, would controlling upstairs, because I noticed you gave him the fluticasone right. uh, inhaler, but I don't know if adding a fluticasone nasal or any of the nasal steroids would have benefited him. Dr. McCormick, do you have any insights into that? Is there a benefit to treating upstairs when you're already treating downstairs pretty well? I think so. And I apply that concept of the unified airway in treatment of patients um, with a history of allergy and particularly when they have upper airway symptoms like this patient. Um, and think about medications like inhaled corticosteroids, nasal inhalers, and then also for patients like this who have more of an established history also with their nasal polyps. And typically ENT or allergists will also use these approaches, maybe using um, nasal, uh, using um, nebulized uh, ampules that are delivered um, as a nasal wash or a nasal rinse. Right. Um, can often be kind of a step up therapy for patients that aren't responding just to the nasal spray. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and those are the patients I am thinking more about biologics. One thing um, for if just if I had this patient and maybe had this type of information um, and it was seeing them in, in for the first time in my practice, I would also be looking to track those eosinophils more because you've mentioned some history of steroids. And some patients like this may also, if they have, have prednisone at home, sometimes mm -hmm. often patients will take like, they just took 10 one day or kind of, if they have them on hand, sometimes they'll take them intermittently. Um, and so making sure that you're thinking about those eosinophil counts and, and linking back to whether they may have, and you mentioned this, um, whether they may be influenced by recent steroid use, just like you mentioned for the exhaled NO because sometimes if patients are taking prednisone intermittently, their eosinophil count will be um, influenced by that and will be lower. Right. right. So particularly, I have some patients too who have had sinus surgery and then the nasal polyps will come back. Um, and really, and, and if they have eosinophilia, they're a great candidate for biologics and dupilumab is the biologic that's specifically indicated for both of those yeah. um, conditions. Right. Uh, it, I found a desert panel uh, that we ran on him, and you might, you probably aren't going to be surprised by the results, but his uh, total IgE was 298 IUs per mo, which is high, and he had a significant uh, class 5 allergy to cat uh, dander. Uh, Does he so have a cat? He has three. Three. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, and then he had a, yes, yeah, so a cat, uh, a German cockroach, uh, dog dander. He had a significant allergy uh, to dog dander as well, and he had dogs. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't know how you tell people to get rid of their pets, but it's either that or breathe. I don't know. But, and then he, he so those were significant. He didn't really have any environmental allergens uh, uh, on this panel. You get the pets out of the bedroom as at least a first step. Right. So right. that's often still a challenge. But yep. uh, it's a good place to start. Uh, or if you can't go successfully go with the bedroom, maybe off the bed also. Right, the right. But yeah. So, I mean, this ongoing uh, patient, but uh, he did have significant relief uh, with the nasal surgery. So we were happy with that. But, uh, and I agree that we, we, of course, we tracked his EOs, you know, uh, over time. And that's important, uh, as you mentioned. So, yeah, I'm glad I got the uh, desert results here. I didn't have them in my uh, uh, case. Uh, thank you, Paul. I, uh, we do have a question from Lisa uh, in the chat. Does his history have any other concerns for pulmonary diseases such as CF with the polyps and the recurrent sinusitis um, and asthma could be a CF variant? Well, <clears throat> his imaging didn't suggest anything like, uh, you know, any cystic uh, or, you know, bronchiectasis or anything like that. I, I didn't, 
think there was an urgency to do any sweat testing. Right, but or, if it was a CF variant, you could be having a very mild case and a variant meaning not the classic picture right. with, the, with the lungs, but you could have more of the, the sinusitis, recurrent sinusitis, polyps and asthma, especially asthma that um, I know he, ha I mean, he definitely has those other things with your um, RAS testing, your IgE. So those are contributing if he's allergic, but um, he might be one of those outliers. And in our cystic fibrosis um, clinic, we get adults um, referred to us that are, you know, older, even older, that right. just kind of went under the radar because they were treated for allergy, they were treated for asthma, and they had this variant all along. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. Uh, we have a we have a adult and child cystic fibrosis center here too, and I work with those patients. I I actually had hadn't even uh, considered that. Only because it had the three: the sinusitis, the polyps, and the asthma. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know if he had anything else. Does he have a history of anything like pneumonias? Uh, does he have any GI issues, constipation, pancreatitis yeah. issues? If he doesn't have, it still could be one of those. You know, now the panel is so huge, those variants, they, they sometimes, we had a woman who was in her 60s who was diagnosed. Yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I had a patient, a classic patient that had a long history, childhood history from Mexico, moved up here uh, in the 90s, had uh, frequent hospitalizations, so-called bronchitis, asthma, well, she had bronchiectasis. So uh, we did a sweat on her, which... The, uh, the the sweats came back in uh, indeterminate, but they were high indeterminate. <clears throat> so then we did genetic testing. She had a Delta 5 and oh. a variant. And a variant, yes. Yeah. So those, those they kind of just right under the radar until right. until either someone puts the whole puzzle together or it becomes something very acute or you have something like bronchiectasis, which is a shame that they get to that point. Absolutely, yeah. Good, that's a good, uh, thank you for that. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, so uh, we only have a few minutes left and we have some of our housekeeping stuff at the end of each of our sessions. So um, if our hub team wouldn't mind, uh, you know, summarizing the case, I feel like we've already sort of gotten there. Paul sort of gave us a summary, but if we could just have a quick summary of the case and then we can, we can scoot on to our housekeeping items, that would be wonderful. So yeah. thanks for that presentation of a patient with allergic asthma who was sensitized to cat and dog and had those pets and also had a history of nasal polyposis and a deviated septum, was on um, uh, ICS LABA, LAMA therapy with poor control and then improved after uh, sinus surgery addressing the nasal polyps. And it sounds like there'll be some ongoing uh, work to understand uh, his post-operative course, which is currently improved. And some of the focus will look at um, his allergens and allergic sensitization and just track his trajectory going forward. Let me know if I missed anything, Paul. Thanks for presenting. That was a great case. That was great. Thank you so Thank much, you. Paul. Thank you. Appreciate that. Echo clap for Paul, really. Thank you so much. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, One of my favorite you. things. Um, all righty. So uh, now we'll just get on to our uh, post-test polling questions. Uh, and now for our knowledge questions. and. Uh, our hub team will give us the correct answer for these in, uh, when we're all done. So the first question is, all asthma that is difficult to control is considered to be severe asthma, true or false? Question two, which of the following represents a patient with severe asthma? Our 28-year-old woman with childhood asthma on ICS, normal FEV1, no wheeze, cough, or dyspnea, a 38-year-old man with adult onset asthma, seasonal allergies, on antihistamine nas and nasal steroid with wheezing cough spells multiple times per week, or a 48-year-old woman cat owner with childhood onset on ICS LABA LT modifier with wheezing and cough one to two times per week. And question three, severe asthma accounts for approximately what proportion of all asthma? Five to 10%, 15 to 20%, 25 to 30%, or 35 to 40%. All righty, Dr. McCormick, how'd they do? So great. Uh, the first question, we got 78% of people uh, got the correct answer, which is false. That all asthma is not, uh, that is difficult control is not considered severe asthma. But, um, should I go on? Yes, please. Okay, sure. And the second question, which of the following represents a patient with severe asthma? 
Uh, and most people got the correct answer, which is the third patient, the 48-year-old female, who um, both the second and the third patient, the 38-year-old, they both have symptoms that are at a concerning poorly controlled level. But the 48-year-old is also already on triple therapy with the ICS, the LABA, and the leukotriene modifier and having that uncontrolled or poorly controlled asthma. So that's what tips that patient into the severe category. So having the symptoms and then also uh, being on max therapy of, or uh, step three, four therapy. And then finally, severe asthma uh, accounts for approximately what proportion? The majority of people also got this correct with the five to 10%. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for answering those. Um, <clears throat> just want to ask, I know we had a few folks uh, volunteer last week to present a patient case. Do we have a volunteer for next week um, to, to follow in Paul's footsteps? All right. Well, you know, we are over our time, so I don't want to make everyone wait any longer. Um, but if you do have a patient that you'd like to discuss next week, please let us know. Feel free to reach out. And if you'd like to attest for credit for this module, just head over to echo.dkbmed.com, um, go to the schedule tab, and then click uh, the claim credit button. And you can take our post test and you can print out uh, your certificate right from there. Uh, so I just want to say thank you all so much for joining us today. Echo clap to the group. We're so excited to see you next week when we talk about phenotypes of severe asthma. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.